welcome to this webinar, Foundations of Technical Analysis, Part 2 of 5. I'm going to hand things over again to Patrick Ceresna, and he's going to take it from here. Go ahead, Patrick. All right. Well, thank you very much, Ryan. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me uh, for part two of this uh, webinar series. And uh, I think uh, the, in the first series, we really tried to hammer down you know, what was uh, what I thought were the core foundations. Uh, we're moving on to part two, where we're going to focus uh, particularly on the patterns on the charts themselves. And so, as we get into parts three, we're going to get into overlays like moving averages and Bollinger bands and things like this. And in part four, we're going to uh, get into indicators, which are all those little squiggly lines that occur underneath the chart. And, but our focus here is to study price action itself. Uh, we want to see the way investors are making decisions on there, how generally there are these geometric shapes that uh, commonly reoccur that start to give us clues that certain things are, are developing. And so, uh, again, just uh, to review, my name is Patrick Ceresna. Uh, I'm uh, uh, the founder of BigPictureTrading.com and uh, co-host of Macro Voices in the Market Huddle podcast. Please have a listen. Uh, it, uh, I think that uh, you'll gain a lot of value from uh, listening to some of our great stuff. So our agenda is to cover these patterns. And so our goal here is to talk about reversal patterns, continuation patterns, and price gaps. Uh, each one of them will spend 10 minutes or so on to kind of get a good idea of, uh, of what each is and why uh, I think they're important. And so I want to re-review a slide that I showed last in, in part one, but I felt it was just really important uh, to step back and reflect on this, which is uh, why technical analysis, right? And fundamental analysis offers an understanding of the value of a company, but what technical analysis, on the other hand, is an observation of how investors are actually allocating money. One must uh, recognize that um, you can't have a price go up unless there are more buyers and sellers. The, the way investors are actually voting with their money is reflective in the way the price behaves. And so the study of technical analysis is, and why technical analysis, I view, is a very nice complement to fundamental analysis is, is that it's actually showing us how that allocation is occurring. Trends reflect sentiment. Investors often are irrational and behave in these herd mentalities, but that price and the way the price is behaving tells us a story that we can build a narrative around uh, and, and give us an idea of the psychology behind it. So the first part I want to really dive into reversal patterns. Now, I want to say this with a caveat because I feel that the one thing about reversal patterns is that far too many beginning traders actually focus uh, way too much on reversal patterns and not enough on continuation patterns. And I'm, so I'm going to start off with reversal patterns, but I want, to, uh, I want to recognize that much more often than not, a price is in a, a sustained trend. Let's say take Apple right now which has been ripping higher for month after month, and it stays in trend. The reversal of Apple's trend is like this one moment throughout the course of the year where a trend that's been in place month after month after month is going to stall. I'm recognizing a reversal pattern is important, but it also is a, a, a big patience game of waiting for when they emerge. Now, the most common uh, ones that I want to review with all of you are known as the head and shoulders uh, and the reciprocal of it, the inverted head and shoulders and double tops and double bottoms. And I want to really kind of dive into understanding what they are and, uh, and why they behave the way they do. So the, in, in this first pattern, uh, the head and shoulders top creates this geometric shape of a crowning formation. Now it looks beautifully geometric here, but when it's in the real market, it actually is never uh, as clean. You know, the, some of the, the troughs are lower than the other one. So, uh, shoulder might be higher. There's all sorts of um, um, sometimes a, a, another retest that occurs. But w so if you're never going to get this perfect geometric shape on it. But what what it is most important to understand is the transition of what is happening when you're in the pattern, which is that during the green arrowed sequence. Uh, an uptrend has been in place, and during the formation of the left shoulder and the rally into the head, 
there is actually very little evidence of an imminent top. In fact, during the rally, during the green arrows, uh, the market looks rather healthy. It looks like it's progressing very well, and, um, and everything is working fine. Uh, subsequently, though, what ends up happening in the final stages when the head is formed of a head and shoulders pattern is that there's a sell-off that occurs uh, of such a magnitude that it wipes out the entire progress the last rally made. And, and this is a, an important clue, because if you stop and think about it, in a, a very healthy bullish market, you have uh, dips being bought, buyers accumulating every little dip, and price continuously progressing. For there to be a sell-off of that magnitude, some big shift and in the selling, um, uh, in the kind of composition of the buyers and sellers has dynamically shifted. As the right shoulder forms, the bulls buy the dip and try to rally it again. And it's almost like nobody shows up for the party. The, this beautiful uptrend's been in place for months, if not years. And suddenly this rally tries to, to ensue. And it just can't make it back to its previous high. What that is, so, uh, I always use the analogy that's sort of like in a sports game, uh, a turnover. What happened is that the bulls were in possession and suddenly they drop the ball, and now uh, now the bears are in control. And once uh, the the, uh, the price action is sniffed out, it reverses, and the selling ensues. And that, and it's a and it's a very common formation. And the, again, it doesn't always have to form in this beautiful geometric shape, but you will commonly see this behavior where a trend is in place. It's lasted a while. And, and suddenly, uh, on the right-hand side, where all the red is developing, suddenly all of that momentum the bulls have had is given back. Now, what the, when we're talking about the inverted head and shoulders, it's the exact same story, but to the reverse, which is something has been in a sustained sell-off. And usually in the push to the head is this kind of a capitulation selling moment where Sellers just almost puke out the the stock, in uh, and some buyers immediately soak it up, and start to rally the stock uh, to undo all of the selling that occurred in the last wave. As the right shoulder of the inverted head and shoulders developing, this is that it sells off again, but this time the buyers are buying and they're accumulating the dips, and there's a transition from the sellers having been in control to now the buyers being in control. And an example of this on a chart here, you can see that the sellers were dominant throughout uh, the formation of the left shoulder and into the head. But as you uh, come onto the right-hand side, you see that the buying was very aggressive. The sell-off did not make lower lows. And immediately the buyers broke it out of the neckline, pushing the trend higher. So you have a, this scenario uh, uh, and a similar scenario develops in double tops and double bottoms. The, the difference here is uh, I always like to kind of make it much more about the memory of investors and traders. So as a market rallies and hits its first overhead resistance level, you have a sell-off that ensues, and everyone remembers what price it traded at. So when you saw your stock trade at $50, and then it pulls back to 45, the common psychological and behavioral um, reaction is, God, I wish I sold at 50, right? And so what happens is that uh, often support resistance is a muscle memory feature where as the price starts to approach the level where enough traders and investors felt there was a, a fair value and a good place to sell, the second time that level is tested, the sellers are ready for it and are uh, amply profit-taking. And it sh shifts the dynamic of momentum that was to the upside to that of the seller. And so you can see here in this pattern is that you had a, a very pronounced rally that, uh, that tested the high initially. It sold off. As it rallied back up to the previous high, was unable to break to a higher high. And, and the moment it retested those, that previous high, the sellers came in and were very actively profit-taking 
all the way back down. And so this uh, is a characteristic of a double top. One thing about head and shoulders and topping formations like double tops and double bottoms is that it's amazing how easy it is for even a beginner to spot them. And this is actually, uh, I think, a bit of a trap. Uh, it's a trap for investors because what it uh, what often is occurring is is that uh, well, we'll talk actually about in continuation patterns uh, how we can almost uh, see a pattern that we want to see based upon our investor biases and we'll talk about that in a second but the double bottom and just to highlight here is very similar retesting of the lows as uh, a price has hit a low. Uh, as it approaches that previous low, a new buying occurs. Now, you can try to create the uh, the narrative that some value investor has now begun accumulating the stock and is now put in a floor or some major support where they're willing to be very aggressive buyers at a certain price point to support it. Other ways, you can also suggest that investors that wish they bought when it was down there previously have a look at it as a second opportunity to get in when that price retest that level uh, and so you can again see a pattern where uh, the stock is uh, uh, crashing down to a, 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 lo a level on the downside it pops higher retest the low to create a double bottom and then uh, once that bottom is established and it reverses a new uptrend ensues so this is what uh, uh, reversal patterns tend to look at for both at the tops and bottoms but actually, what I want to focus far more with you is in continuation patterns, because in my mind, continuation patterns uh, are uh, more valuable, more valuable because more often than not, prices are in trend, and they pause and continue in trend. And therefore, more often than not, I find myself using continuation patterns more so than I'm using tops and bottoming formations. I mean, obviously, a lot of investors uh, love nothing more than the glory of getting the absolute bottom or selling at the exact top, and therefore, they put a lot of emphasis on, uh, on reversal patterns. But I would say that your, uh, for most traders, the bread and butter comes in recognizing a trend and recognizing when to stay with a trend uh, and, uh, and when to buy a dip. And so the patterns I want to cover in this continuation phase, so I want to look at wedges, flags, flats, horizontal triangles, and ascending and descending triangles. And uh, so the first pattern of a wedge is, uh, is interesting uh, and because they tend to be deeper. When we get to the flags in a moment, you'll see they're very shallow. But what often will happen is when we get into overlays uh, in the next webinar series and we put on things like moving averages, as a corrective wedge is declining, often it will vi violate a, a tight moving average and break to a little bit of a lower low, often uh, uh, kind of drawing investors to believe a top is in. In fact, uh, a lot of beginners will often see and that little pop in the middle of the wedge as the right shoulder of a head and shoulders pattern when they, uh, when they believe that a major topping formation is developing. The key is, is that, uh, and there's this old saying for flags and wedges, is that the, uh, the, the um, flag flies at half mast, which is, is that when these wedges and flags develop, often they are only the midpoint of a continuation pattern. And so, so when you have this type of a, a, a consolidation, even though it zigzags into multiple corrective patterns, it is often a key buying opportunity when it reverses and continues uh, on its upside. And so we can observe on this chart pattern I have here, notice that the first sell-off takes a pause and then it still breaks to a lower low, which often will draw investors to want to short sell or call it a major top. But it, often these uh, wedges just simply correct downwards and uh, resume higher. And, uh, and more importantly, unlike the head of a head and shoulders pattern, rarely will you have, well not rarely, it's actually not within the pattern for it to give back the entire last rally. So imagine where the first arrow pointing upwards uh, a head of a head and shoulders would sell off and give back uh, almost all of that rally. 
more often than not, wedges give back about half of the prior rise. Uh, you know, we, we, we can get into Fibonacci's and all sorts of other things that measure these. But, but really what it comes down to is that you're looking for a consolidation pattern that will lead to a continuation. And that is also to the reciprocal, to the downside. Often you will have a stock uh, in a substantial downtrend and having been so selling aggressively for a while, then what it will do is it will, in a sequential series of zigzags, uh, bounce and retrace half of uh, often I'm just going to use half as a benchmark of of the prior loss before rolling over and continuing downwards. The the, the again the tricky part is is that a lot of investors may uh, uh, that let's say are believe that the stock is cheap and believe that there should be a bottom will often see that zigzag in the middle and and perceive it to being the right shoulder of an inverted head and shoulders and they will uh, will subsequently believe that they're buying a breakout and it almost immediately reverses and continues selling lower and so you have to always be careful of these continuation patterns developing and so you can see, uh, see over here that you have a very distinct downtrend it spends you know something in the line of 20 30 candles uh with in this case it was a daily chart you know a, pretty much a month retracing the losses before it rolls over and actually continues to sell off now the uh, an, another variant of the same pattern is a much more what i would call a shallow flagging formation and uh, the predominant difference between a wedge and a flag is flags are much shorter in duration and far more shallow in their nature. So notice uh, if I just quickly go back to the, this bull, uh, uh, bullish flag. Notice that this may have lasted 20 candles and, and pulled back even half of the prior rally. While if you look at a bull flag, notice that this kind of a, a pause in the market barely uh, you know, dented the prior rally and only lasted, let's say, five or six candles in the sequence before rolling up and beginning a continuation. And so, uh, so often um, these are actually far more bullish because if you think about this, something that can consolidate for an entire month, like a wedge, uh, means that the, uh, that the selling is pretty sustained. But if you have a very pronounced bullish trend, and it just pauses for four or five candles. I'm saying candles because you could be using an intraday chart. Uh, but uh, but let, if it was a daily chart, let's say it's pausing for four or five days, if it's suddenly breaking to a fresh new high and off to the races, it is demonstrating from a price action perspective that this is being very bullishly accumulated and it continues to actually be uh, very well bulled and the continuation is very likely to to, to follow through, and um, and that's the same as the reciprocal as of of, a, uh, of the bear flag, which is that is far more shallow and far shorter than a uh, you know than a wedge. Often it will only last at in both these examples just by chance. I've, they're about four or five candles long, but it, I don't think that that's something that you should uh, pigeonhole it at. I mean I've seen flags that last two, three candles. I've seen ones that last 10 candles, right? So it's not about a candle count in the middle, but it's more about the fact that the market pauses a trend that's been established and then resumes. And back to that old saying that's in technical analysis is that flags fly at half mast, which basically means that if you identify one of these consolidations, um, the continuation is uh, it kind of gives you an idea of how much more upside or in this case of this chart how much more downside there is for a stock before it can establish more meaningful bottoms so uh, now uh, a flat is just a pattern that is uh, another variant of the flag uh, and I'm not going to even give it much more lip service because really everything that I just said about the flag is the same on a flat only observation is, is that rather than the price correcting downwards, uh, it corrects sideways. It's, it's be, and in general, it actually is a sign that the price is being far better bold. Uh, it, it's something that where the, that after a run, you would anticipate the bulls would be 
um, uh, or taking some profits and the price would be backfilling a little bit. If it's being very well accumulated during the consolidation, it means that the buyers are still very much in control. But you know what? Uh, the one observation I want all of you to capture here is, is that before the breakout to a higher high, how many traders that want to believe that there's going to be a double top would see one there? And that's, a, that's the, uh, I guess, the criticism of uh, pattern recognition in general, which is that uh, it's in the eye of the beholder. I mean, if you are determined, let's say this was Tesla, and you are determined that Tesla is a big short, then every time it does a consolidation, you just, uh, because of your bias, will often just immediately associate that with a double top or a topping formation. More often than not, I would actually encourage many of you to assume that a prevailing trend that has been in place will remain in place uh, uh, on, on balance of probabilities. And that a topping formation is something that often is better to first allow it to establish itself so that the trend, a new trend is established rather than assuming every little consolidation will start to develop as a double top or double bottom. So, uh, so I want to move on here and uh, talk about triangles. Again, what I want you to capture something from all of the consolidations. Whether we're talking wedges, flags, flats, or triangles, they're really all the same thing. All we're doing in technical analysis is trying to cookie cutter a different geometric shape on it. But what, it, what you want to, in your mind, a picture is simply a market makes an impulse move, uh, whether higher or lower, and then once it runs out of momentum, the stock pauses. It consolidates and unwinds an overbought or oversold state. Then it bases from there and resumes in the direction of the trend. And all we're doing with these different geometric shapes is, is just illustrating the different ways stocks have a tendency to consolidate. Uh, and um, and so uh, the, a, tr a horizontal triangle like this is just a variant of a flat, which is a variant of a flag. Uh, they're all th the, in principle the same thing, which is is that they're a pause in a trend that will continue after the pause is over. And so a horizontal triangle winds up with lower highs and lower lows in a sideways consolidation and then continues in the direction of the trend that was already established prior. And so, and uh, now uh, there's a, a, another sequence of candles called ascending and descending triangles or patterns anyway. And what I want to simply point out is again, the ascending triangle like a flat uh, has a tendency to um, be perceived as a double top rather than a continuation pattern. And so a lot of traders, as, we, as you go into the, uh, after the correction of the first arrow, it rallies to the previous high. And when traders see it reject a, a retest of the previous high, immediately assume it's a double top and want to start short selling it. But I want you to go through a small checklist in your mind. What is the prevailing trend? It's been up. And overall, every low, a sequential low is at a higher low. Um, and so, therefore, it is actually still being on balance accumulated, assuming that just because it's bumping its head on overhead resistance means that it has to stop here and that it won't continue is often a trap. Uh, uh, and the one thing I've learned in 20 years of trading is, is that it's amazing how long trends last and how far they go. And uh, assuming that every short-term burst higher will end in a topping formation is, uh, is something that has cost traders lots of money many times in assuming something before it's confirmed. And the point being, the sending triangle will often look like that double top or a, a, a topping formation, but then will break out and just continue higher from, from that breakout formation. And that's the same to the downside, which is often a trader will see uh, in the eye, uh, you know, as someone who's looking for a bottom and believes a stock is cheap, will start to fish and believe they're witnessing a double bottom developing when in fact it often is just a triangle that develops into a continuation pattern lower. 
And so notice here, after that, into that second uh, test of that low in the middle, notice that it's very easy for a trader to want to start believing that it's going to be a double bottom and that it's going to bullishly reverse. But in the end, the price is being very well uh, distributed. Every rally is being sold. Every high is lower. Uh, this, is being, uh, this is being actively sold. And as it's being distributed and sold, and once it breaks that support, it opens the window for uh, another decline to continue uh, to the downside. So that, those are what I, we call continuation patterns. Uh, when we go into modules uh, or uh, parts three and four, and we're looking at overlays of moving averages and or different indicators, you will see how they naturally complement many of these patterns um, and give us uh, uh, an additional filter from which we can filter uh, the patterns that are emergent. So the final thing I wanted to cover in this segment is price gaps. And, uh, and not all gaps are equal, and I wanted to make sure that this is very clear, that what are the different gaps. So what is a gap? Um, gaps tend to occur on stocks more so than on futures and things like that because futures contracts and forex contracts and currencies trade 24 hours like gold trades 24 hours and all these different commodities trade 24 hours. Uh, and a stock opens at 9.30 Eastern time and closes at 4 p.m. Eastern time. And so you have uh, in the scenario that, let's say there's an earning an, uh, earnings announcement uh, while the, the stock is closed or some major news announcement occurs while the stock is closed, it will open at a different price than where it closed. Often this leads to a price gap a gap where a stock didn't trade through a level, it just closed at one price and opened subsequently at a different price, leaving this big gap in between where the price simply didn't trade. And so how do we differentiate between the different gaps? And so this is where I want to uh, just highlight the five different gap patterns, common gaps, runaway gaps, uh, reversal gaps, and breakaway gaps. That's actually four gaps. I just separated the bullish and bearish breakaway. And so let's, um, let's kind of go through this and, and cover this. So a common gap is a gap that will often fill within a short period of time. So, uh, so there's, there's some people that swear that all gaps inevitably get filled. I think that's nonsense. Uh, that doesn't have to be the case at all. But it is common for common gaps to fill, which means that the price will break away, trade higher, leaving that first blue square as a gap. And subsequently, as the candles, uh, um, as it continues to trade, the trade, uh, the price trades lower and, uh, and uh, trades into that window, the blue window that was the gap in the first place. And so uh, an example of this uh, and the characteristic of this is that you can see here that as these prices in the circled areas gap, that you will see that the prices inevitably came and traded in that gapped area. And uh, the, the way that I would leave it is that often stocks that are not in pronounced trend tend to just have fake out common gaps, which is, is that there's no um, statistical advantage to you having seen the gap and traded it. Uh, it, uh, it, it just inevitably, you'll pro uh, you know, weeks uh, later, you may have a tactically better price to buy or sell, and there was no uh, advantage for you acting upon that gap. And, that, and I would say that well, definitely more than half of gaps uh, are common gaps. But let's talk about the other gaps that are wor worth paying attention to. Uh, and one that is very common is a runaway gap. And a runaway gap is a stock that has been in trend, uh, continues to rally, thinks a stock like Apple uh, as uh, in over the last two, three months. Where, by the way, we're recording this in uh, November 2019, if you're watching an old recording of this. Uh, and in the prior months, Apple has just been running. And what happens is as the stock is rising, it may gap higher, 
and just run away. It just keeps going. It doesn't even look back. It just it, it, it just gaps and goes. And so you can see and often that gap may be caused by an earnings announcement or some other very positive news or in the, in the gap lower, negative news that the company announces. And the, the news or earnings were so significant that they're forcing a complete and total repricing of the stock to a new price level. And, uh, and uh, tra- uh, traders are not going to go and have a gap filled because there's some rule in the market that says that all gaps are filled. When you see a breakaway gap in a trend that's been established, often they'll run away. And you're just not – if you don't buy right there and then, um, then you're going to – uh, um, miss the opportunity to see the stock continuing to trend higher. So now th- that's a runaway gap. Now what you'll also see, and it's important to be able to distinguish, uh, is, is that once a trend is incredibly overbought, uh, one in clue, now by, by the way, I want to really emphasize something. It is almost impossible or very, very difficult to be able to identify an exhaustion gap until it's hindsight uh, and it's not a, a tradable pattern in my mind it's not like that gap higher i would turn around and say i'm going to short sell this gap because i believe it's going to be an exhaustion gap i mean some traders are, are tactically may try to do that but i don't think that that's what i want to convey to all of you but but the one thing is that once a stock has been in trend for an extended period of time. And when we get into different indicators, you have, let's say, uh, a relative strength index that is incredibly overbought or some other type of an indicator that is, is very overbought. Sometimes what happens is that the price will gap higher and the sellers will say, I'm taking advantage of this and I'm going to give the market all of the stock that they want. And they basically use that higher gap to do all of their structural selling. And then they just begin to just sell everything. And by the time three days have passed, they've unloaded a huge chunk of stock, having taken advantage of that gap higher to actually do almost all of their uh, uh, selling operations. And um, it's, again, not a pattern you will be able to identify often right off the bat. In fact, many of you may initially uh, observe this gap and assume that it is a a breakaway gap. Uh, But if you see that uh, uh, in a trending market, a gap occurs and then they close the gap almost immediately, you have to be highly suspect that something is wrong with that and it's not a breakaway gap. uh, And so you can see, and this is an example right over here, you can see the trend was trending higher, gaps up, and almost immediately the gap marked the high and it just sold off from there into a a corrective wedge pattern, uh, giving back more than half of the prior rise. And so, so an exhaustion gap like that um, it occurs and will look like that where it just simply cannot build any further traction. So um, now uh, the one uh, pattern I want to illustrate to all of you here is uh, the last gap, which I like to always wa- observe is breakaway gaps. Now earlier I it went through the checklist of uh, many of the same patterns that we saw of flags, wedges, the continuation patterns of flags, wedges, flats, triangles, ascending triangles, all of these. And what happens is that what you want to observe is that sometimes a gap that occurs out of a consolidation is actually like a starting gun uh, sending off uh, traders off to the race. And so what you want to observe is that a stock, let's say, that had a pronounced uptrend, then pauses and stays within a flagging formation or some other triangle formation. And then some catalyst is emergent that causes the stock to gap higher and signal that the resumption of the trend that has been established prior is beginning and continuing. Um, This is uh, one of my favorite gaps to observe because it often is a sign that you want to have a continuation. So in this uh, uh, this pattern, whether you want to observe that as a a wedge consolidation that gave back half of uh, its prior rise or whether you want to look at it more as a triangle formation, Notice that the moment that gap occurred out of that triangle and made fresh new highs, it basically signaled 
the continuation of the trend that's been established. Now, in this case, this gap was very pronounced and went uh, quite an extended way. But the gap, uh, just any gap that really signifies that a new trend has emerged. And um, an example of, uh, of a pattern like that recently was a gap higher uh, of Microsoft, a fresh new 52-week high. It was consolidating sideways in a consolidation pattern and then breaks to a higher high. That has a lot of the same kind of characteristics that you would commonly want to see in a breakaway gap that way. And, uh, and in the same manner, what you will see is, is that sometimes a breakaway gap to the downside has the same effect. So you have, let's say, a, a pronounced downtrend that's been very well established. You have a, um, a pattern where the price, let's say, retraces or, or bounces, you know, giving uh, back half of the prior decline. And then suddenly some event or some news or some other uh, catalyst causes the stock to gap lower and signal that the trend, that downtrend that's been established prior is now in full resumption and will continue. And, um, and so uh, always observing when you have some sort of a consolidation pattern and then uh, a breakout out of the consolidation is always an, an interesting gap to observe. So that's what I wanted to cover in, uh, in part two. When we, uh, so in, uh, just to kind of review what we did in these series, uh, we, we started off in part one with foundations. Right now I just covered through all the patterns and gaps uh, and uh, understanding all of the foundations of that. When we get together for part three, we're going to get into technical analysis overlays. And now overlays versus number four indicators is whether the indicators are on the main chart or whether they're in some sort of oscillation, uh, oscillator that sits underneath the chart. And uh, it's just uh, our way of distinguishing that. So we're going to be covering everything from Bollinger Bands to moving averages and things like that in part three. So just keep an eye out for when that next webinar is scheduled, and I'll be happy to take all of you through an understanding of how we can use those different overlays to get a better understanding of the price action and where opportunities exist. And nonetheless, uh, uh, thank you everyone for joining me. Again, my name is Patrick Sobresna from Big Picture Trading, uh, and uh, please enjoy our free complimentary podcast that we offer at Macro Voices and Market Huddle. Otherwise, Ryan, come on, I'm back here. Thank you so much, Patrick. We're really, really happy to have you back, and we're really, really excited to see part three. So again, thank you so much, and we're going to move on now to questions.